as you know that treatment of cancer is a shift for operation between different specialties. Because the treatment of cancer, usually there is no single modality for management of cancer. The main lines of management of cancer is surgery, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, the plus minus other um, things which are required for the treatment of uh, cancer. Uh, the surgical oncology, it is one of developing branches from the general surgery where the people start to concentrate only in the management of cancer. And according to the Society of Surgical Oncology Training Program Guidelines, they define who is the surgical oncologist. A surgical oncologist is a fully qualified surgeon who has obtained additional training and experience in multidisciplinary approach to the prevention, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation of cancer patients and devotes a major portion of his or her professional practice to these activities and cancer research as well. So that uh, in, uh, in, in a state of general surgeons doing everything, including malignancy, focusing on cancer probably will give the surgeon more experience in the management. And one of the important things is the uh, cooperation or integration of the surgical oncologist with the other uh, parts of the team, mainly the radiotherapist, the medical oncologist, and we usually we start our life with birth, then we have a latent period where the people exposed to different or several carcinogens for a long time, and probably at that stage, an attempt to develop malignancy is there. And at this period, before having the symptoms, before having the symptoms, if we can apply what's called screening, uh, some of early cases, either having the disease or having the precursors of the disease. And once the patient established the tumor, we will, we will try to have a diagnosis. And when the diagnosis is early, usually the treatment is better. And then we do a staging to the uh, malignancy. And after that, we have to apply the appropriate treatment and to follow the patient up for the sake of recurrence, either systemically or locally in the area, or detecting of other cancer because the patient with cancer, he is more prone to develop malignancy than the others. And probably the process of death, we have to go through the process of death. There are two types of death. There is a respectable death and there is irrespectable death. So that we are trying when we cannot afford giving the patient more life, we can give him yeah, a decent type of death. And everybody knows what we mean by a decent death and a terrible death. So along this journey, a surgical oncologist is concerned about different aspects in the management of cancer. Mainly, he is responsible about prevention. He is responsible about the diagnosis. He is responsible about treatment of primary tumor. He is responsible about the resection of metastasis in certain situations. Uh, he is responsible about management of some oncological uh, malignancies, which may be related to the uh, disease itself or to the treatment uh, of malignancy. Also, there are uh, concerns and interest in the palliation of patients with uh, malignancy. If we cannot eradicate the tumor, we can treat the patient's uh, symptoms to make his life more or less comfortable and decent. And surgery for residual disease, and surgery for reconstructive procedures, and what is called the cytoreduction reduction in the tumor size, and we will talk about this, and uh, regional uh, infusion of chemotherapy. We have to go through these different terms briefly. Surgery for cancer prevention. As you know that uh, prevention of cancer can be primary or secondary. Primary prevention that 
before development of malignancy, we look for a changes in one of organs, and we try to treat these precancerous lesions, uh, and probably this will prevent formation of malignancy. And one of the examples is, is the leukoplakia and the erythroplakia of the oral cavity and time, the thyroid gland, in the case of the dullary thyroid carcinoma, coronary carcinoma, and the, the breast where the high-risk uh, factors are present in, in patients who have a positive family history where they have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations. And this is an example of what is called leukoplakia of the tongue. And if you leave the patient with this lesion, this lesion will ultimately lead to malignancy. So that in treating these lesions by what's called shaving procedures or excision will prevent formation of malignancy. And for the coli, where, where the people, they develop thousands or hundreds of polyps, and by the age of 40, if those patients were not treated, usually they will develop colon cancer, so that we will attempt to remove the colon before having these consequences, and in this situation, we can save the patient from having a colon cancer. Also, in patients who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, and those patients are high risk, probably we can do some sort of mastectomy for those people and do some sort of reconstruction. Also, uh, surgeons are interested in doing uh, secondary screening. For example, colonoscopy in patients having colon cancer or in colon cancer. Screening by colonoscopy may detect early lesion and lead to treatment, and this will uh, probably uh, lead to the prevention of malignancy. Our target in, uh, in this situation is to detect changes in patients having ulcerative colitis, for example, or in patients having adenomas like villus or tubular adenoma. Those are precancerous <coughs> situations. Also, digital literal examination plus the PSA is probably a proof uh, of value in having an early detection for patients uh, with prostate cancer, which is quite common cancer. And the clinical breast examination, besides the mammography, it probably lead to an early detection of a breast cancer where the treatment is simple, not costly, without affecting, and the cure rate is very high. Interested in the diagnosis of uh, breast uh, of uh, cancer in general. And you know that diagnosis of malignancy, it should go through the same approach like any other disease. We start by doing history and physical examination. The history required to detect risk factors, to detect symptoms related to the cancer, and to, to detect the fitness of the patient for a treatment. Uh, usually there, is, there are no specific symptoms for cancer. And usually cancer, uh, the symptoms related to the cancer, is the, is the uh, symptoms of the diseased organ. For example, if a patient having lung cancer, he will have probably dyspnea, cough, hemoptysis, shortness of breath. And if, if we have a patient having laryngeal cancer, for example, he will have hoarseness of voice. Patients having uh, gastric or coronic cancer, they may present by symptoms and change in the bowel habits and uh, probably anemia. So that there is no specific symptom for malignancy. However, in advanced stage, advanced stage, in most of the people usually they have general symptoms of malignancy, where in striking changes in the uh, body weight, there is a significant loss of body weight, there is loss of appetite, and there is severe nutritional deficiency in those patients. So that if you uh, imagine that patient having gastric cancer or sphygian cancer, you will find that this patient is anemic, emaciated, weak, with loss of uh, weight and loss of appetite. Those are general uh, symptoms related to the malignancy. But if you are looking for early cases, usually the symptoms coming from the organ. There are warning symptoms. For example, bleeding anywhere, bleeding uh, uh, through the urethra, hematuria, it may indicate presence 
Yemchini to urinary malignancy. A bleeding per rectum may indicate the presence of coronic malignancy. Um, uh, we have what is called some. We need to do some investigations for those people, and those investigations mm -hmm. having two purposes. One, to assess the fitness of the patient to the coming treatment or chemotherapy or surgery. And we need to stage the patient to know the extent of the disease and to predict the prognosis and to decide, to decide the line of the management. And the last thing is to gain a histological diagnosis. There is, if there is no meat, no treat. Yeah. So that uh, we, we need all the time to have uh, a histological diagnosis, except in very small special situations where the biopsy is not amenable. For example, in patients having spinal cord problem or uh, in uh, brain problem. But in most of the cases, a tissue diagnosis is required before starting the treatment of those patients. Histological diagnosis can be given by different techniques. For example, the needle aspiration. The needle aspiration, as we said, it gives you uh, a clue about the changes occurring in the cell. Okay, but it will not give you an idea about the infiltration. So that uh, probably with other things, as we said in the triple ass assessment, uh, uh, we can accept the needle aspiration, it probably uh, provided that you know, you uh, psychologist or pathologist, how experience he is and how he is doing this work. And the second one is the true cut biopsy, then a signal biopsy and the signal biopsy. I'll give you examples for this. This is what we call an signal biopsy, uh, sorry, finding the aspiration, where a needle go to the tumor, go in multiple directions, and it will be spread on a slide and fixed and sent to the histopathology and read it. We can take the biopsy in case that we cannot palpate the lesion under uh, a stereotactic technique where we visualize the tumor by a uh, radiological machine like this mammography and try to do the, uh, the biopsy uh, under uh, stereotactic technique or even under ultrasound guidance. But usually the surgeon who feels the tumor, he can go directly. And after that we said it should be sent to the pathology lab and treated. We have a true cut biopsy. The true cut biopsy, we have machines, different machines with different gauges, and those giving us different tissues uh, uh, according to the uh, type of the machine. Uh, actually, we have, yeah, at least we have to have 10 to 15 milligrams of tissue in order to make adequate uh, tissue sampling and diagnosis. As you see that this is done uh, under local anesthesia, we can take this course, as you see here, and send it for the pathology, and this will give you an uh, uh, adequate and enough diagnosis. Sometimes you see that those core biopsies with microcalcification, uh, you, ne you need to be sure that the core biopsy containing these calcifications, so that you may do radiological imaging, like this mammography, to detect those microcalcification, which may indicate the presence of breast cancer. The other form of uh, biopsy is incisional biopsy. We take part of the tumor. Okay, now this is decreasing with the development of a true cut biopsy, but when you remove part of the tumor for the sake of the diagnosis, we call this an incisional biopsy. And uh, sometimes we uh, refer to what's called exigenal biopsy. Exigenal biopsy, I think that this is the worst type of biopsy, especially in patients with breast cancer. When you, you remove the tumor, you will leave bleeding, you may leave infection. You, you, the, when you attempt to have a definitive treatment, it probably you are going to lose uh, more tissue. And sometimes if a patient amenable for white local exigen, she may require Mastectomy, so that this is not advised. However, uh, exigenal biopsy may be in the 